mistakes. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Anna. <laughs> We're trying to push the envelope, and y'all just sitting there looking. I need you to write this down. The land of make-believe. Week five of the vision series. The land of make-believe. Let me help you to understand how important this sermon is to me. I told a couple of people close to me, including my wife and a couple of close friends, that if I died tomorrow, I would want this sermon to represent everything that I want to say. It's a real tough crowd this morning. We have too much watered-down preaching and people-pleasing preachers, which is why there's no miracle signs and wonders in the global church. We have for too long placated the entertainment aspect of Western Christianized thought, so sound doctrine is not received very well. The moment something is said that is offensive to your personal construct, you up and leave and find another place that will allow you to be who you are so that the word can fit your construct as opposed to us fitting inside the word. So you really weren't looking for a savior. You wanted to be God with some help. I'm not here to offend anyone in particular. I'm here to speak the truth of the word and allow the word and the person of the Holy Spirit to convict each individual as the Holy Spirit chooses to. So if the shoe fits, put it on. If it's not, pass it down. I feel the power of God coming upon me to preach this word in an effective way. Sometimes the most impacting sermons don't answer all the questions. They simply ask the right questions. So this morning I'm asking for you to, instead of being a casual observer and sitting there only listening, I would ask that you would engage, perhaps even write down in your vision journal or in your notes in your phone, some of the things that I'm about to say. Because for too long, the enemy has been able to pick us off because we don't know what we believe or why. And I don't have the luxury of borrowing my mother's faith at this point in my life. I must purchase my own. In a world of plastic bodies and plastic lives, it's hard to discern the real from the fake. In a world of fairy tale dreams and nightmare realities, it's hard to tell what is true and what is not. In a time of quick and easy, the very idea of enduring hardship as a good soldier, as the scripture so eloquently states, is an ideal whose time has come and gone. In a microwave world, are there any slow cooked saints anywhere? Microwave Christianity is more of a threat than heresy because at least heresy you know is a lie. But microwave Christianity makes you think that you're mature when in fact you're just hot on the outside, still uncooked on the inside. And everybody wants to be an apostle, a pastor, a prophet, a teacher, and a preacher, but don't want God to instruct your character, deal with your integrity or the machinations, motivations, or ambitions of your heart. People want the platform, but do not want the process. And when you get a platform before the process, insecurity sets in, jealousy sets in, anger sets in, greed sets in, lust sets in, and people are led astray, which is why people don't trust the church. They don't trust our motive or our heart, and it's sad because they filter us through the lens of their own experience. When I went to speak and meet with government officials, some of the comments included, how much did they pay you to go? There are people who are so mistrusting of faith leaders that they believe that they are compensated to do things. And why in the world would they think that? Because there have been times in the past when that was the case, where people were for sale based on their influence and ability to lead people. But I bind that devil. 
I'm not for sale. You can't buy me. I've already sold out to Jesus Christ. I will die for this gospel and God kill me right now. If I've ever been for sale for anyone, for anything, I can't be bought. I've already been bought with a price. And if you want a compromised preacher, go somewhere else. But I'm going to preach this book until I die. Now, it's quiet on this side, but I know it's because you all hear my heart. And I'm here to speak to everybody watching online, those who are a part of the Relentless Online community, and the lurkers who are hoping I say something offensive so they can turn it into clickbait and a soundbite. Do whatever you want. Say what you want about me. I'm not going anywhere. My name is John Gray. I am the son of Alice Gray, a prophet and a woman of God two-time cancer survivor. She told the devil, not today, not now, and not from this. And since the devil couldn't have her, he came after me, and he can't have me either. I will die one day if Jesus doesn't come back. But until then, I'm going to live and preach this gospel until I move devils out of Greenville, Greer, Spartanburg, Atlanta, everywhere else that God sends this word in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Mississippi, New York, LA, Texas, Chicago, Australia, London. I just need a church that'll say, I will not be made to be silent. The effectual preaching of the gospel requires uncompromising voices who will speak truth to power. And I'm not talking about people, I'm talking to principalities. Letting devils know, you got to get out of this region because we're here now. I need some help in here. I noticed that there was warfare in worship this morning and I need y'all to get ready for 11 o'clock because we're not leaving worship till I feel that thing break. You were right to sing that song. It's breaking in my favor. It's breaking. I want y'all in them mics. I want y'all on the edge of this stage and we're going to make sure that devil is run out of this region. The devil of racism, the devil of religion, the devil of common, the devil of institutionalized thought. I bind every devil that has caused us to miss the move of God by his spirit. Preach, pastor. I think I will. God is looking for some leaders and believers who are willing to endure hardship. Have you ever gone through anything? One, two, three, four, five. Have you ever gone through anything? More still, are you willing to go through anything? I don't mind going through, Pastor Trevor, as long as he's with me. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because thou art. Is there anybody that says, I'll go? Just go with me. 70 people. Is there anybody that will say, God, you, wherever you send me, I'll go. Just don't leave me. I'm not going if you don't go. If you didn't tell me, I'm not going. But if you told me, I'm going. Because the Bible says we are to endure hardship as good soldiers. Soldiers are under command. You don't get to do what you want. You don't get to make up your own orders. When you serve God, you go where he tells you. Sometimes it's safe. Other times it's dangerous. And depending on your skill set, he'll put you on the front line. And sometimes you get wounded because other soldiers don't understand your assignment. The land of make believe. I want you to know this morning what Relentless Church believes because it's important for you to know if you're going to be here what we stand for. So if you want to know doctrine, doctrinal statement of faith, the tenets of Scripture, the efficacy of Scripture, the unquestioned authority of the Holy Ghost to lead, direct, and guide the leadership of this church. If you want to know the questions about who we are and what we believe, this sermon is for you. I don't think you should be a part of any ministry if you don't know what they stand for. 
A lot of people go into the popular place. Don't go to the popular place. Go to the purposed place. And when you go to the purposed place, make sure they're a rooted place, rooted in the word of God. Because if it's not, if it's based on the personality of man, it will not stand. Everybody wants to be hip and cool and rock beanies and be chill and all of that and be, you know, all whatever. But the reality is all of that is just external. If there's no Holy Ghost, it's not going to last. John chapter 18, starting at the 33rd verse, Jesus is standing before Pilate, a Roman prefect. He is a Roman official. The Jews had to get permission from the Romans in order to crucify Jesus. So they bring him before Pilate, and these are the words that are recorded in the 33rd verse. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus, and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? Tell somebody, where'd you hear about Jesus? Ask somebody else, where'd you hear about Jesus? I can always tell people who have their own personal relationship with Jesus, they have a different light in their eyes. And this is not to disparage anyone who's in search mode, because the church should be a place where you can search and ask questions about truth without fear of judgment or reprisal. There are people here right now and those who are watching who are saying, I don't know about this Jesus. I don't know if this is real or not. Just keep listening. Give me just a few moments. Pilate answered and said, am I a Jew? What he's saying is, do I believe what you believe? I'm a Roman government official. They're trying to kill you. I'm trying to help you out. Jesus is like, you don't even know who you're talking to. I'm trying to help you out. Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? Jesus answered, you rightly say that I am a king. For this cause I was born and for this cause I have come into the world. That I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, what? is truth and when he had said this he went out again to the Jews and said to them I find no fault in him at all the land of make believe what is truth in an era of moral relativism and secular humanism when truth is now subjective I stand here this morning to declare that the conventional wisdom and the societal push towards the three most dangerous words I believe that the devil is utilizing in this season are upon us. Live your truth. This is not a sermon against free thought. It is not a sermon against personal choice. It is not a sermon to say that you're not allowed to live your life. Because the truth is you can do what you want, but there are consequences. Because what's true for you may not be true for me. Because my moral code and construct might be different from yours, which is why there is a problem with those three words, live your truth. Because living your truth might affect my life. It might affect my family. It might affect my child. And you try to live your truth with my child and you're going to meet Jesus. Can I get an amen from anybody in here? Truth is dying in westernized culture. People always ask, how do you believe a certain thing? How do you know what you believe is true? What is truth? Why did you come here this morning? Is this a cultural expression of religion because we are in a geo-religious construct where people go to church on Sunday morning? Are you here because you grew up going to church and it's just the thing you do before football? Or did you come here because you believe Yeshua HaMashiach is the prophesied Messiah, uniquely born of a virgin that was 
given to the world as a gift to pay for the sins of all mankind. And if you believe that, does your life reflect that reality? Because it's one thing to say you love him, but the scripture says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So you can't say you love him and live your truth. might thin out the membership, but that's okay. I'm going to preach it anyway. You don't get to make the scripture fit your construct. I don't get to decide preferential sins that I think should be added to the list of things that don't matter anymore to God. They still matter to God. Jesus, the Bible says in John chapter 1, he was full of grace and truth. So he's both. Yes, there's grace for the sins we commit, but there's truth. There's a consequence, and truth is not subjective. I don't get to decide what truth is. Truth is an immovable reality, and truth, my brothers and sisters, is not a concept. Truth is a man. Truth is a man, and his name is Jesus. We are in a place where people don't suffer truth anymore. We live in a world of virtual reality. We live in a world where we can't really tell the real from the fake. And sometimes even in church, we can't tell the real from the fake. Scripture says that in the last days, there'll be a spirit that is so deceptive and pervasive that it will deceive even the elect if it were possible. That spirit is already at work in certain elements of the church where people are trying to dishonor the validity of scripture by saying that it's myth and mythological and it's not real. And did, did, did Jonah really sit in the belly of a fish for three days? Come on. Was there really a garden? Was there really, did he really take a rib out? I mean, come on. And so there are people who are believers. They say they're believers who attempt to de- Deauthorize scripture. They, they attempt to reduce it to the idea of man, but man can't make up God. I need some help in here. People say things like, I don't believe in God. There is no God. And that's fine if that's what you believe. You're allowed to believe that. People say, I'm not superstitious. How come there's no 13th floor on any hotel? Nine, 10, 11, 12, 14. Isn't it funny that even secular folk are superstitious? I'm trying to help y'all in here. It's ri- Let me keep preaching. They say one thing, but their lives show another. People are like, I'm not superstitious. Then go to a hotel and stay in room 666. <laughs> uh, I need y'all to change this room. I thought you said you weren't a believer. I'm not, but just in case. See, people play games. Because the truth is, they, they want to believe when it's convenient. But in this season of inconvenient Christianity, we need to make a decision on who Jesus is. Matthew 16 and 13, he said, Who do they say that I, the Son of Man, am? And as they gave their conjecture and ideas. He then asked the pointed question, who do you say that I am? It is the central question in all of human history. Who is this Jesus? He is the most polarizing figure in the history of humanity. People can't stand him and other people love him. People hate his guts, and others laid down their lives for him. Who is this Jesus that Josephus even said was a good man and wise, and he did great works, and his disciples recorded that he 
was presented to them after his death and resurrection and maybe he's the Messiah. These are the words of a Jewish non-believing historian, Josephus and even Thallus, a non-believing Christian hating uh, historian said that on the day that Jesus was crucified, there was darkness over the whole earth absolutely authorizing and declaring that what scripture said happened but then he said these words but it wasn't a big deal it was just an eclipse but the truth is the Passover when Passover and crucifixions happen they only happen on a full moon so it was impossible for there to be an eclipse on that day and so even the people that hate Jesus gave evidence that he is who he says he is who is Jesus to you in a land of Easter bunnies and Santa Claus and tooth fairies and aliens. What's real? Is Jesus real? And if he is, then why are you so silent? C.S. Lewis described it as this. It's not a dilemma, it's a trilemma. He's either lunatic, a liar, or Lord. I, I wish I had some help in here, Pastor Todd. C.S. Lewis says he's either a lunatic, a liar, or Lord, but whatever he is, you can't dismiss him. He's the central figure in all of human history, and the effective preaching of the gospel requires that you make a decision on who he is. Is he a lunatic? Somebody walking around crazy just happened to multiply bread and loaves and fish? Or is he somebody crazy who happened to open blinded eyes and stretch out withered hands and people who touched the hem of his garment got healed? She, he didn't even heal her. He didn't even know he healed her till he turned around, touched the him is he a lunatic was he just walking around saying crazy things then it's easy to dismiss him or is he a liar if he's a liar then he's the devil himself deceiving a whole world into living a nice life with good works serving other people visiting people in prison giving to the poor meeting the needs of the elderly the orphan and the widow the bible says a bruised reed he would not break this jesus who touched lepers met with prostitutes talked Zacchaeus out of a tree this Jesus if he is a liar then he's a good liar a liar that did good things and not just good things for good people but good things for bad people and even liars don't do good things for bad people I'm trying to help somebody in this church this morning either he's a lunatic a liar or he is the Lord Can, can somebody give him a praise if you believe he is Lord? But we are dealing, Cousin Angie, with different presuppositions. Because in my generation, we were less cynical than today's generation. All you had to do was teach me, Mama, and I believed it. I watched your life. All you do is had to tell me who. Who is it? Jesus. Amen. Where's the altar? But this generation is a why generation. Why Jesus? How come not Buddha? How come not Krishna? How come not Muhammad? How come not somebody else? Well, what about Jesus? Is it real or is it myth? Is he another fairy tale? You told me the tooth fairy was real and that didn't turn out. You told me Santa was real and that didn't turn out. Now you're telling me Jesus is real? What's the difference between Jesus, Santa, the tooth fairy, and aliens? Well, here's the difference. You can study not just scripture, but you can study other historians who said he was who he said he is scripture and faith and presupposition are bedfellows you can actually study the historical context of scripture not just taking the word of the writer you can look at outside sources that verify the words of scripture which means my faith is not just up in the air ethereal but it is investigatable <laughs> tell somebody study to show yourself a I need some help over here. 
There are people who say, why are you preaching this message on an 830 service? Because I'm here to tell you right now that the devil's hoping you don't wake up to the reality that when you get this thing on the inside, it will turn this whole region upside down. Scripture is verifiable, it is justifiable, it is investigatable. That means you need to study Scripture. People are counting on you to not know your word. They want you to think Jesus is the picture on the funeral fan. You need to have an investigatable relationship that's why sometimes scripture, mom, is so frustrating to me because Jesus didn't just come out and say it. I'm God. He was always saying, there was a, there was a, there was a parable. There was a, there was a lamb. There was 99 there and one was gone. 99 sheep were there. 99 problems, but a sheep ain't one. If you're having sheep problems, I feel bad for you, son. Well, Jesus, are, are you God? There's the parable of the talents, and the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. And the kingdom of heaven is, just say it, man. Why didn't he just come out and say it? It would make it so much easier. But Jesus knew the human heart and the condition of the intellect of humans. We don't need somebody to blurt it out. We need somebody to drop breadcrumbs. If you want to know more about me, grab the crumbs. Even the Syrophoenician woman said, even the dogs eat the crumbs from the master's table. Is there anybody willing to get the crumbs? See, each week is one more crumb. See, that's why you can't just come one Sunday. You can't just listen to one song. You got to get the crumbs. You got to get that word. You got to eat that thing. You got to feed on that thing. You got to dine on that thing. You got to hunger and thirst for righteousness so you shall be filled. Jesus is not just the idea of man. He is a historical figure. He actually lived. We can investigate the life of Pontius Pilate. We can investigate the life of Herod. We can investigate the life of Caesar, Augustus. We can investigate these things. And then it is left to you. Is this thing real? And if it is, then what you believe is not up for debate. I see my young boy over here, a young man back there, a young lady back there. There's a woman of God over here. I said, my faith is not up for debate. I'm not here to argue with you about what I believe. I'm not even here to convince you. I'm not here to make you believe Jesus is Lord. It's my faith. It's my walk. And he walks with me and talks with me and tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none of has ever known. I wish I had some old saints in here that knew some him. Is Jesus who he says he is? And if he is real to you, then it doesn't matter what anybody says to you. You believe all that Bible stuff. You really believe that a virgin had a baby? Yep. Well, it, it doesn't make sense. That's why it's called faith. Why are they so offended about what you believe anyway? I'm trying to help someone. Why are you worried about my Savior? I didn't tell you to worship him. I didn't tell you to believe in him. I didn't tell you to tithe. That's what I want to do. I want to praise him. I want to bless him. I want to lift him up. I want to give him glory. That's me. It's enough fake stuff in the world. Jesus is real. I've seen him. I, I know him. I've tried him. I've got evidence. Has Jesus ever done anything for you? I'm going to ask you again because some of y'all are a little quiet. Has Jesus ever done anything for you? The reason why people are offended by Jesus is because he made it clear, I'm the way, the truth, <laughs> and the, I'm truth. 
I'm truth. I'm, I'm truth. Me. You looking at truth. I'm the fulfillment of the law. And I'm truth. Can't get around me. Can't get rid of me. I'm just here. People don't like truth because you can't manipulate truth. Because if there is a universal truth, somebody is right and somebody is wrong. And today, people, everybody wants to be right. Let me help you to understand something. While I respect each individual's right to faith or no faith at all, the danger of the church is this idea of universal ecumenicalism where everybody is all, everybody just come together and what you believe and what I believe is just all the same, just minor details. No, no, they're major details. That Jesus is a major detail. He, he's a major, that empty tomb is a major detail. That cross is a major detail. I need you to understand in a world of Santa Claus, Bigfoot, carnivals, Superman, mermaids, bunnies, somewhere in the middle, hidden amongst the trees is a cross on a hill, on a hill far away, stood an old rugged cross. I need I'll save the rest for 11 o'clock. Well, do you want it or not? I am not here to debate with you about my personal faith. In a land of make-believe, Scripture says, Oh, God. In Mark chapter 9, there was a man whose son had a deaf and mute spirit. Is Ah! The disciples couldn't cast this devil out. Jesus said, bring him here. And he said, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. The father said, Lord, I believe. Help my. All of us have areas of great belief and great unbelief. There's no judgment here. We are a community of faith. The foundation of our faith is Jesus Christ. And it's all right to have strong moments of belief. And I welcome the issues and battles of unbelief because sometimes we're both. Oh, it's all right. He said, Lord, I do believe. I'm going to need you to help me right here. Got a little unbelief right here. I got some belief right here, but I need some help with the unbelief right here. I'm trying to help somebody in here. In the land of make-believe, just keep eating the crumbs until this thing becomes real to you. And the people who are violently opposed to your faith will expose that they don't have peaceful motives. They're trying to talk you down from the faith that saved you. My Jesus is not a myth. That he lived is a matter of historical record. That he lives is a statement of my personal faith. In a land of make-believe, I want you to know that these 66 books are the inerrant word of God. Inspired by men of God, they are the word of God for reproof, for correction, for rebuke. And they are what we need for every area of our lives. The Old Testament was a shadow. Jesus was the fulfillment. He is the law and the prophets. Behold, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. And I believe. <laughs> no. <laughs> I believe. That Jesus is who he says he is. And this church will be built on the back of that revelation. I believe what the Bible says. Don't ask me what I think. What I think doesn't matter. What the Bible says is what matters. Bow your heads, close your eyes. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for your heart. Thank you that in a land of make-believe, your word stands. 
and we will not apologize for it. Be glorified in this moment. We give you honor and glory in Jesus' name. With heads bowed and eyes closed.